I was numb, I was terrified, there was no place to run, there was no place to hide. I didn't know where I was, and even if I had run back and gotten my clothes and run out, what was I then going to do? Not just where was I, but I was not prepared. I was 19. I was not prepared to have a child. My name is Elizabeth Stone, and today I'm going to tell you the story of an abortion I had long before abortions were legal when I was a 19-year-old college student. Even when I was trying to get a sort of contact, I didn't go around and announce myself. I had friends who spoke about a friend who needed something. And one night, soon before I was going to go home to Brooklyn for Christmas vacation, someone slipped a piece of paper under my, under my dorm door. And it was a phone number. It was a New Jersey phone number. And I never knew who put it under the door, but I knew what it was. I called the phone number and it was the phone number of a doctor's office in Union, New Jersey. So I went to the, the, the doctor's office. Um, he said to me, are you pregnant? I said, yes. He examined me. The word abortion was never mentioned. And I knew that I would be, I had been told that I would be receiving a phone call on a pay phone the next day to set up an appointment. I had been told that a driver would pick me up, but that if he thought there was any chance of him being followed, he would just drive by. A little dapper man with shiny black shoes and a winter coat got out of, because this was December, got out of the car, came around. I handed him the envelope. He opened the envelope, made sure that everything, that the $500 was in there. He then nodded, opened the car door for me. I got in the back seat of the car. He got in the front seat. In the car already were, were two other women. Car ride was silent. I didn't know where I was, didn't know where I was going. Um, the driver, after about 10 or 12 minutes, pulled into um, an indoor uh, parking lot. The day before I went, I had been reading the New York Times, and there was a story in the New York Times about a woman who had been found, her dead body parked in her car, had been found in front of her house. And the story went on to say that she had died during a botched abortion. The first thing I saw was a kitchen table, and every horror story I had heard about abortion sooner or later involved a woman getting an abortion on a kitchen table. A man came out of the door on the right carrying an unconscious semi-naked woman in his arms. She was like a, a floppy doll and she had a tampon string trailing between her legs and I was horrified. I was horrified that the driver was watching all this. It felt like an enormous violation on top of many violations. He carried the woman across the hall into the second bedroom, and then after a minute or two, came out. I didn't know whether she was dead or unconscious. Um, and then he waved us, the man who was wearing blue scrubs, he was wearing a mask, was he a doctor? You know, I don't really know. He waved us down the hallway and we went into the bedroom on the right. And that was set up like a, almost like a, a barracks. I mean, there were six cots, um, each against the head, against the wall. And three of the cots were already filled. This was a little bit after seven o'clock in the morning. And so it meant that the day, the abortion day, 
started well before dawn. Those women had to have been picked up at around four or five in the morning. So we were the second, we were the second round of the day. But the room to the right that he had taken the first woman out of, I looked in, he had left the door open as he carried her out. I looked in and I could see an examination table. And on the examination table was the sort of white paper, or maybe it was a, a, a sheet that doctors use when they're examining someone. And it was covered in blood. It, was a big, it wasn't pools of blood, but it was a big, big blotch of blood. And I then understood that that was where the abortion had taken place. All this I, I glimpsed in an instant. Um, there, I then went in, got changed, sort of, and I was, I was not in a hurry to have this happen, but I was so anxious to get it over that I was the first one out of my clothes. And the man in blue scrubs came back and said, okay, you, you're ready. And in the interim, he had put a clean sheet on the examination table, which would then be filled with my blood. I smelled bleach and, and the water was, the bleach was pink because that was where he put the bloody uh, towels or sheets or whatever it was. And then he said, okay, get on the table, count backwards from 10. I got to about eight and that is all I remember. The next thing I remember was being in the barracks, in the cot room coming to. Nobody talked about trauma in those days, but what we do know now about trauma is that traumatic memories remain very, very vivid for a long period of time. This was an abortion I had half a century ago, and I may not remember whether it was a paper sheet or a sheet sheet, but I remember the blotch of blood on it. There is not a woman alive of childbearing age today who remembers what it was like to live at a time before Roe v. Wade. I am someone who wanted to have children. I always knew I wanted to have children. Motherhood has been one of the most powerful experiences of my life. You don't have to have children if you don't want to. I'm not an advocate, you can have children, but I would not have been able to be a good mother as a 19-year-old college dropout. I would like everybody to know what it is, not that we're going to go back to, but we are already going back to. All over the country there have been erosions of Roe v. Wade. I think there are three abortion centers in all of Louisiana which means somebody somewhere is standing on a street corner in a, in a strange city at six o'clock in the morning waiting to go through with this. I do want everybody to be forced to imagine a dead woman behind a steering wheel. And, and I was a middle-class kid with supportive, with supportive parents, parents who could help me financially, a good boyfriend, great friends, and I still was in a situation where my sense of my powerlessness was overwhelming. <laughs>